I'd like to call to order the um, planning and zoning meeting for 11-14-2022. Uh, if we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Paula, could we do roll call, please? Commissioner Corey? Here. Commissioner Dupa? Here. Commissioner Dumpster? Here. Commissioner Kovacevic? Here. Commissioner Watts? Here. Vice Chairman Schlossberg? Here. Chairman Gray? Here. Thank you, Paula. Um, before we move on to agenda item three, just a reminder, if you wish to speak on any agenda item this evening, there are speaker cards located in the back corner of the, uh, of the hall here. Uh, please fill those out and deliver them to Paula, uh, and we'll call you up for the three-minute allocation uh, for the agenda item that you so choose. Uh, with that, number three, uh, call to the public. Paula, any speaker cards? No, Chairman. Thank you, Paula. Agenda item four, consideration and possible action, approving the regular meeting minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission from October 10, 2022. Paul, I see we got a new software. Yes. Very nice, mm -hmm. very nice. I realize that I need to work on some of my pronunciation, but <laughs> <laughs> overall, very good. Uh, commissioners, any comments or a motion, please? I'd like to make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission October 10th, 2022 meeting. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven zero. Thank you. Okay, number five, public hearing in consideration with possible action on Ordinance 2208 to amend Chapter 1 and Chapter 12 uh, by adding provisions to allow indoor shooting ranges into the C2 and C3 zoning districts as a permitted use and in the CC common commercial and C1 neighborhood uh, commercial and professional zoning districts with an approved special use permit. Farhad, your presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. That was quite a mouthful there. But uh, as you said, uh, this is uh, in consideration of uh, uh, allowing indoor shooting ranges uh, in the commercial zoning districts uh, with certain provisions depending on which uh, zoning districts we are speaking of. Um, so this is per uh, direction from the Planning and Zoning Commission from the, uh, uh, the fall of the September meeting. Um, though it's staff initiated, the, uh, the impetus for this is recent interest in establishing an indoor shooting range um, uh, here in the town of Fountain Hills. Indoor shooting ranges are not specified in the zoning, uh, uh, zoning ordinance. That's why a particular case uh, came before you um, uh, in September. Um, although this that I'm presenting before you right now, to be clear, is not site specific. This is a, a zoning ordinance text amendment request. So the proposal is to allow uh, indoor shooting ranges within the CC or the community commercial district and the C1 neighborhood commercial uh, zoning district with a special use permit. And that would require a public hearing and also to allow it in the C2 and C3 zoning district as a matter of right. So uh, staff felt it is important to define the terms here and leave no room for ambiguity. That's why staff is, uh, as you can see in the beginning of the report, is proposing a definition of an indoor shooting range to be added in chapter one of the zoning ordinance, particularly in the definition section. So um, staff proposes this following definition that is modeled, modeled after another uh, zoning ordinance um, here in the country. Um, but an indoor shooting range is pretty well defined as an enclosed permanent building open to the public or members of an organization where firearms are discharged at targets. Uh, so nothing more, nothing less. And so the proposal, as I said uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, is to allow this use in uh, the commercial zoning districts. However, uh, also as I mentioned earlier, it is to allow it with 
the provision of a special use permit in the CC and C1 zoning districts. Um, if you look at the zoning ordinance, uh, the CC and C1 are identical in terms of uh, the uses that are allowed. Um, the only difference being that uh, in the CC uh, zoning district, uh, one is allowed a common parking area to uh, serve all the uh, uh, units or separate parcels within a uh, commercial area. Um, also, these two zoning districts, are th their primary purpose is, to in, uh, is intended to serve the surrounding neighborhood with small business enterprises or to serve the larger community with uh, 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 certain services. However, in the C2 and C3 zoning districts, they're, as, as you may very well know, they're more intense and they serve a, a much larger uh, market area. And uh, incidentally, uh, when looking at some of the uses allowed in, uh, in the C2 zoning district, uh, particularly, one finds that uh, a pool hall or a fitness center is allowed as a matter of right in those, in those zoning districts. And in terms of uh, intensity, uh, staff felt that an indoor shooting range is, is very similar. So uh, our analysis and, and, and staff recommendation uh, is, is based on the following findings that uh, the, the text amendment, as I mentioned, is uh, in response to recent interest in establishing an indoor shooting range, um, which I will uh, discuss a uh, site-specific case in the next uh, 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 presentation. It also provides a definition and recognize it, recognizes it as a distinct use uh, again, currently, it's not mentioned in the zoning ordinance. It would expand the, uh, the invent inventory of potential sites for indoor shooting ranges and encourages, uh, particularly for special use permit cases, it uh, encourages detailed analysis uh, of factors such as the traffic impact to a particular site, appearance, noise, and business hours. And uh, I might also add uh, whether or not a particular indoor shooting range is open to the public or if it's, uh, it's membership-based. That is something the Planning and Zoning Commission and the, and the Town Council can, can consider when presented with a, a special use permit case. It also provides some opportunity to control the use in specific areas. And uh, in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the uh, Zoning Ordinance Text Amendment as presented before you in, uh, in the ordinance uh, 22-08. Uh, and at this time, I'll be open to any questions you might have. Commissioner Kovacevic? Uh, I don't have any questions. Nice. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Watts? Uh, Bart, I've got one no question. light. Wrong button. <laughs> oh, a question. Somewhere in that section 12 of the zoning, uh, I remember the, I think it was C2, I'm not positive, but there was the, by right, recreational use for the public or members. Why wouldn't this fall under that? For, particularly for C2? Yes. Why, why wouldn't I, I this think it was. Use? Uh, yeah, I think it was C2. Right. Uh, it might have been, but it, it yeah. could have been C3. Uh, I don't, Mr. Chairman, don't members of the commission, uh, I, 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 we felt that was a, a, a little, little vague uh, to just simply categorize this as just uh, one of the many uses that would fall under a recreational use. I thought it would be of benefit to avoid uh, you know, any, any ambiguity to specify it as a specific use, as has been mentioned in some of the other zoning ordinances. Um, that uh, we, we looked at across the valley, uh, including Scottsdale and uh, uh, Mesa and so forth. But in that light, shouldn't we take out then recreational facilities so if, to avoid the ambiguity in the future? Mm. Uh, well, I, it's, a, it's a good point. I certainly haven't given it much thought, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, it, it might, uh, we might be uh, removing a, uh, uh, you know, the possibility of some other uses that might fit in that, uh, in that category. It was just a curiosity. I mean, when I, when I look at it, this is a recreational facility, whether right. you, you yeah. agree or you don't. But if you're going to leave it in, mm -hmm. 
you leave in that ambiguity for other things that might occur. And if you put this in, I, I, I don't know if we're going through an exercise that isn't, isn't necessary or I'm not quite, I don't quite understand it. Uh, Chairman, Commissioner Watts, I'm not going to address your, your comments specifically, but in a more general nature. One of the side projects I have been working on is a, a redo of all of our commercial classifications because they are getting kind of jumbled over time as we add different little things in. And so hopefully before too long, that'll be another item I'll bring back. And we'll certainly be looking at that in a way to kind of recategorize and, and clean up some of these things that are in there. But I don't see any, any short-term issues with this that's specifically helpful in the C1 and the CC districts to have them listed specifically because we are trying to target, no pun intended, the specific use in those districts and, and what, what would be allowed. We haven't studied other ones besides this one. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're considering the the land use prospects of, of a shooting range. The if they're allowed by right in C two and C three, um, the building specifications and I mean our, our petitioner has gone through great lengths to build us a, a safe range um, does that will if it's used by if it's um, permitted by right uh, staff it, it can go through staff and it's up to staff to make sure that the um, the plans and specs are appropriate yeah mr. chairman uh, uh, members of the commission correct uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that they uh, meet uh, certain standards to ensure that uh, the, no, no noise escapes from the building, that it's properly insulated, and um, okay. make sure that every all the all the activity is contained entirely within the building, and that uh, that would require staff requesting perhaps documentation that that specifically addresses uh, those concerns. Thank you. Commissioner Dempster. Thank you. Rahad, I um, am curious why we're including CC in doing a special use permit for this use. And I understand you said the only difference is common parking. Um, but I'm, I'm very much in favor of this of not, just, but uh, we um, work hard in buffering um, commercial and residential. And I don't, I did not look back at a chart to see what effects it would have, how much um, CC zoning we have. And I know a significant amount is next to residential, but was that for ease to just include it kind of across the board or what was the thought right, behind uh, that? Chairman Commissioner. Uh, in terms of where um, uh, the CC commercial zoning districts and the C1 commercial districts are located within the town of Fountain Hills, um, they they share the same characteristics as far as you know how they are situated uh, next uh, near uh, major intersections. Um, as I mentioned, uh, and as you mentioned, the only the only difference being common parking areas. Um, which is only allowed in the CC and not the C1. Um, otherwise, the uh, uses allowed are identical, and um, the term, there might be some differences in parcel size, uh, but um, as far as where they're situated uh, in relation to uh, intersections and other uses, they're very similar. Uh, Farhad, just a couple, um, I guess three, three questions or points I wanted to raise. Um, one, I just wanted to ask, was there any feedback from economic development um, one way or another on this proposed amendment or, um, or even no, 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 you know, no opinion? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this case has been 
brought up this proposal and the, and the, and the case that's going to follow has been brought up at staff meetings, um, uh, weekly staff meetings with the, with the managers, um, uh, where there was an opportunity to, uh, to chime in by economic development, and, and we haven't. Okay. Uh, so without haven't objection. Yet. Right. Um, and then I, I know you mentioned um, in response to Commissioner Kovacevic, um, you know, design criteria and, and standards. I know we've had other cases in the past where um, noise in particular uh, and how that's applied with respect to uh, commercial operations and there's, I guess it's not quite clear in, in my mind, but I, I obviously could see this particular use, um, you know, being a repetitive, um, a repetitive noise, um, you know, at a, at a fairly high rate being something that's probably paramount important to uh, importance to adjacent stakeholders, how can we tie down um, the, the zero noise escape or zero decibel escape within our definition or elsewhere specific to the use? Just again, you know, pointing to the repetitive nature of, you know, of, of a firing range, um, et cetera. And, and then wanted to, to also just look at it from the lens of, you know, a door opens is, is you know, can we prescribe a Sally Port type of uh, scenario with within design criteria to where you know one door opens one door closes so you don't have that opportunity uh, to adversely impact um, you know adjacent stakeholders mm -hmm. homeowners etc right uh, mr. chairman uh, not being a an expert on the design of shooting ranges I'm not sure how much I could uh, provide I we, we do have uh, representatives from uh, from uh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of your uh, action target here. We might be able to shed some light on that and, and uh, provide you know suggestions for this particular. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I guess I'm I'm really interested in that as something that we would bake in. I mean, I'm I'm um, you know not having gone through the public hearing portion of this, but having addressed this last last month or two months ago, um, I think you know I think we're pretty comfortable with where this is heading. But um, I think that that's something that. If we don't tie it down, I think that it you know, may not get away from us on this one, but it could on the next one. And then my last um, inquiry is just kind of playing the what if game here. Um, I know we talked about this two months ago and, and what caliber um, would be um, uh, fired at this location, but do we also in our definition need to put a, a cap on, uh, on caliber size for an indoor range? And that's somewhat of a naive question. I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not well versed in, in shooting ranges by any uh, by any means, but is that something else that in defining you know what an indoor shooting range is, do we say up to caliber X kind of thing? And, and maybe that's a, a collaborative discussion with with Action Target as well. Mr. Chairman, that, uh, certainly that uh, you know those points can be brought up. Uh, uh, you know, if this were to be approved as proposed, then that, that's certainly questions that can be asked for the special use permit cases. I'm not sure about the uh, the C2 and the C3 uh, zoning districts, however. Um, I, I can say looking at uh, other zoning ordinances in the Valley, and uh, I've, I've looked about five or six where this use is specified. Um, however, in terms of specifics, it doesn't get down to that level as to caliber size or um, sound attenuation and, and, and things of that nature. And, and maybe yeah. where, I, where I'm angling towards is in the yeah. C2, C3 districts, you know, up to a certain caliber and then mm -hmm. special use permit trigger over and above that potentially. Um, anyway, just sure. yeah. for further discussion as the night progresses. Yeah. Commissioner Watts? Two more questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One pertaining to uh, the CC and C1. Do we have to give a special use opportunity in those two zoning areas? Or should we be more specific and say it only applies to C2 or C3, whichever one we uh, land on? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Watts, uh, I, I certainly, uh, we, we certainly would be open to uh, tailoring this in such a way um, that w would be more, more appropriate. Do, uh, do, do we have to, does it have to be a, a, a considered and approved as, as presented? No, I mean, it could be. You know, thinking uh, along the lines of Commissioner Dempster that, yeah. There's a sensitivity issue all, right. all around and putting it in the CC or C1. Sure. Um, and the other thing is that we, our building codes 
cite an awful lot of standards across the country, whether it's an AIA type standard or whether it's some building association. Uh, I'd suggest that we utilize this as kind of the poster child for future endeavors, maybe along the lines of somebody wants to put an indoor racing cart uh, scenario somewhere. I don't know if we've got the size for it, but something else that is noisy where we can mitigate the noise problem, whether it's the vestibule concept or whatnot. So I think those would be good things to incorporate into our building codes. I'd like to see something along those lines. Yeah, I, I concur with Commissioner Watts on that. I think one of our main obligations is to preserve welfare of all adjacent stakeholders. So I'm very much in favor of that. Uh, commissioners, any any other thoughts for Farhad before we open the public comment? Okay, Paula, do we have any speaker cards? No, Chairman. Thank you, Paula. Well, Farhad, you're back on the mic again. Uh, final discussion or uh, a motion, or I guess I should ask, do we have any, um, any presentation from the applicant? Actually, this is staff initiated, but okay. I, yeah, so um, certainly, Next, uh, next I, I, I would like to discuss uh, the two points around, you know, potential, you know, what's an appropriate max caliber up to, um, and then, you know, what becomes potentially special use over and above that, and then um, any thoughts regarding language um, that would assist with um, noise containment. We, we addressed a noise ordinance at some point before, correct? And, yeah, and but we, but we haven't changed. There's still a there's still a noise ordinance in place, and it is specific as to how many decibels, at what time. It is not specific as to how many decibels at what time. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of discussion about metering and calibration of meters and who did or didn't want to use meters and uh, it was also geared towards residential when that was discussed and that that's the I'm going back to a case a couple of years ago but it was all sorts of uh, deliberation over what's appropriate mechanical noise from a from a commercial building you know when it abuts residential and and the end result of it was that um, it's very subjective that, that some of those those criteria do not apply. And so I think in this case, when you've got, you know, when you've got pop, 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 you know, I wouldn't want to live next door to that and hear it even in the slightest bit. Um, I'm in favor of the amendment, but I, I would like to see some, some prescription that, that addresses that. I'll address that. I mean, if you've been to a range, I mean, you, you don't, if you've been to a range, you don't hear anything outside of the mm -hmm. confine, I mean, at all. As a matter of fact, when you walk in, you don't really hear anything until you actually go into the actual active shooting area. So, as far as sound concerns outside of the building, mm -hmm. just from a personal experience, okay. there, there should be none. Yeah, I was going to say that it was my assumption as well that it was zero. So, that the, decibels wouldn't really apply in that case. So I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but we all say zero, experience is zero, but what if the next applicant comes in and says, well, you can just hear it a little bit. You know, it's not more than a car yeah. starting, you know, but it's still that pop, pop, pop. If I own the house next door and we're allowing this in C0 or C1, I would be in here every week. But isn't that why we're we talked about incorporating the building profiles of building code into our building codes so that it, assuming for the moment there's a zero today sound outside the building and there's a couple of facilities in town in Scottsdale that you can't hear anything until you get next to the windows and then you can hear something but mm -hmm. marginal so you incorporate that into the building codes and make everybody adhere to that in the future don't you resolve that problem? I think so, but that's not where we're at today, I guess, is my devil's advocate position. Just thoughts. So, Chair may have already addressed this, and he said it a lot more eloquently, but just to kind of simplify it a little bit. 
so when we're so right now we're just simply approving whether the SUP can go in CC or C1, and if it's by right in C2, C3. So by if this gets approved, what are we locking ourselves into at the C2, C3? So when it comes to like membership versus non-membership, and I don't know what that entails, but I think it would be something that we'd want to know about. Can people just walk in and use this place? Um, and then how would noise be addressed if, say, they said it was going to be zero and it ended up being, you know, higher? You know, how would how would that get addressed at that point? And then, like um, Chair said, the caliper. So if we are approving this, are we locking ourselves into something at C2, C3, or does that get addressed another way through, like, the building codes and whatnot? Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, um, well, certainly in the cases of C2, C3, if there's ever a proposal um, for an indoor shooting range in any one of those districts, um, staff can certainly, uh, I'm not sure if stipulation is the right word, but place some sort of a condition um, that would ensure that no noises to escape the building and that may be in the form of um, providing some sort of uh, some sort of documentation, um, like design criteria, or design specifics okay. that will be applied uh, to ensure that. And then, if after approval and after construction and final inspection and so on, if there's a, ever any complaint about uh, uh, any kind of noise uh, escaping the building, then that would certainly. Um, be a violation, and, and uh, we could uh, ask the uh, owner to take corrective action. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking maybe the petitioner could help us out a little bit with who are the the governing uh, the bodies that um, so, just create the standards for building shooting ranges. Right. So I hired, or we're working with Action Target, they build an NRA certified range. And he'll answer any more specifics, but bottom line is it has to meet a certain standard. The caliber is AR500 rated or lower, which for us is important because if we want to let law enforcement qualify, that's the kind of caliber they also use. And finally, the access corridor, like you were mentioning, um, yeah, you go in, one door shuts, then they go down and into the range, and one door shut before the other door opens. So, and as far as noise goes, it's basically to your property line, there's no noise above the normal sound that you hear. For instance, when Chris was here, this is Tyler from Action Target, he used his decibel meter, and cars going by were up to 100 decibels. Um, right now, what we have, if you were to go in there right now and shoot into a bullet trap, the decibels outside the building is about 77 decibels, and we haven't even done the wall yet. So once you put in the wall, just like um, Vice Chair Schlossberg mentioned, you can't hear it. Mm -hmm. Now, in that very um, rare circumstance when somebody might open a service door, at the same time that people are firing, there could be some escape, but it still won't make it to our property line before it's washed out. And the, to meet your question about certifications, if in the special use permit they put NRA certified range, indoor range, then that would meet all that criteria that you were mentioning. And then the caliber would be AR500, which would meet your caliber question, and then the access corridor is built into any, any NRA certified range. Did I miss anything, Tyler? Sure. Uh, just for clarification, it's the NRA range source book, which is everything that is built off of. So that's something that you could Google and find documentation by the, the NRA. Uh, the second thing is on the caliber. Um, I would personally recommend uh, doing some sort of caveat or something based off of the FPS of a specific round that you're interested in. We brought up how uh, local law enforcement agencies use AR-15s, which uh, typical uh, FPS is around 3,000 feet per second. Um, that's very common for a rifle round. So I would recommend uh, any caveats to be based around something like that. And then uh, specific to the range that uh, is being designed for this, 
uh, we're looking to do an eight inch solid concrete building essentially within the proposed site. Uh, no sound will uh, escape that building and then there's a minimum of four foot uh, space between the range wall and the exterior wall. So the sound has to travel through a lot of space even before it reaches the building walls and that's let alone the property line. So we're talking about a lot of space for these, for these rounds to be heard through. Question. Okay. Well, I just wanted to get clarification. So AR 500 and 3,000 feet per second? The uh, AR 500 is a classification of steel that we use. It's abrasion resistant steel. 500 is the uh, determining factor. So that's, um, that's not necessarily related to a rifle round but what we use to protect against rifle rounds, if that makes sense. And, and is there a scenario in the industry where, uh, is, that, is that measure warranted in your experience? Is there a scenario in the industry where, where um, there's ranges built that you know, exceed that um, feet per second? Uh, exceed the feet per second, yes. Uh, there's uh, cartridges in the industry like a 50 caliber, for example, that does exceed the 3,000 foot per second. Uh, and in those instances, the design of a shooting range would vary slightly. Um, the AR-500 protects everything up to a 50, a 50 BMG. And if we put that constraint on the, um, on the range design, does that unduly burden um, the average applicant? The, in reference to the AR-500? No, the okay. 3,000 feet per second component. It definitely, um, it's not an undue restraint. Now, it, it, that, is a, that is very common rifle round. So you, as, as action target, we would allow all pistol calibers and nearly all rifle calibers to be shot on a range. And, and then one more question and I'll, I'll uh, uh, concede to Mike, but on, obviously in, in this case, this, this application, you know, this text amendment is all, um, it's got good, it's got good merit and it's got good expertise behind it through Action Target. Um, your, your colleague was here a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, is there, a, are there other standards out there that, I guess I just want to ask, am I, am I promoting something that's overly cautious uh, in wanting to include some of these basic design standards? Um, or has it been your experience that, you know, all applicants that you've, that you've come across or know of um, would be automatically designing to a, a minimum standard like that? Uh, the, the minimum standard that Action Target has designed to is to allow pistol calibers only. So the 3,000 foot per second is above that. Um, so this is what we're discussing right now is above what I would consider a minimum requirement to be that is being a pistol caliber only range if that answers your question yeah, so just from a different angle so I, really I'm talking about noise escape mm -hmm. um, it, are there other designs out there or uh, ownership groups out there who say yeah you know I appreciate the NRA standard but Let's you know. Let's save dollars where we can save dollars, and and uh, maybe push the envelope a little bit further on noise escape to property line or, or beyond. Does is that scenario out there that warrants us saying, hey, let's tie this down a little bit tighter to the NRA standard, or um, you know, or something similar, or does that just not happen? Uh, it's. I would say that it that it is out there. The NRA is the baseline. Um, so when especially when action targets designing ranges, that's what's used. Um, obviously, if uh, a if no ma range manufacturer is chosen to move forward with a commercial range, uh, corners can be cut. Okay. Uh, can, can you, what was that standard again? The, the NRA range source book. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kovacevic. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Watt. Um, two questions, one for the applicant, and that is the 3,000 FPS, to me, it, it's a good factory load, but 
if somebody's loading, reloading, mm -hmm. they can hot, run hot loads. Absolutely. And we'll never figure out in time to do anything about it. That's a problem. So you're not gonna be able to preclude it. You have to rely on the vestibule, you have to rely on the walls. You're not gonna be able to catch the guy or girl that's shooting and runs a hot load, mm -hmm. pure and simple. Mm -hmm. So while you spec cite the, st the standard, we still have to rely on what's reasonable and the management of, of the facility to control these guys, wh whoever's on the range. So that's just a comment. Second comment is, uh, as far as I'm not a proponent of including the CC or the C1, and I wanna get a clarification on C2 and C3, thank you, by the way, uh, for which has the most restrictive hours? Because we talked to the applicant last time about their hours of operation. We don't, to my knowledge, didn't want 24 hour operation. So which one, which classification should we look on, look to to limit those number of hours? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, uh, both the C2 and the C3 allow 24 hour operation. I thought one didn't. I thought one had more restrictive hours because. Uh, that would be the C1. Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why, uh, if, if you recall uh, previously, um, their request was to rezone the property mm. to a C2. Um, it, with this use being the impetus for that rezone request, but it still opened up the possibility. I didn't, of I didn't bring my notes, so it's like, oh, oops, no, I had to get a clarification. I did just have one more kind of technical question for uh, the other person that was speaking, and I forgot your name, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's Tyler. Tyler. Uh, and I'm asking because uh, I've never actually been in a shooting range before, um, but as it comes to security, like what kind of safeguards are there in place for somebody to not walk out with a gun, or like are they, are they chained up, or are they, like how does that work? <laughs> Guess what, we're in Arizona. <laughs> Everybody could be carrying right now, according to the law. So a lot of times customers will carry, but the range protocol is that you bring your firearms unloaded in a case, and then they leave in a case. But we are also a FFL, so we sell firearms. And believe it or not, a lot of people are armed when they come in. Okay. And so that's already happening. We can't control that part. I but see. our protocol within the range is everything's unloaded in a case, and there's just a certain protocol. That's why, I mean, another reason why we want a membership-based program, because everybody goes through the same training. That was going to be my follow-up question. That, so that is what you prefer, is that membership program, so no, nobody just off the street can walk in and oh, say, yeah, I want to come in today? I mean, okay. I'm happy for as many restrictions as you'd like, because we set this up to be member-based. But as the city's doing it, you guys aren't just looking at me, you're looking at other people that may come in here and, and stuff like that. But again, it goes back to what we talked about before. We're really, really looking at like an 80% member-based program and having some non-member-based use so that we can have let law enforcement qualify and have special events and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quick question for the, uh, the same gentleman there. Have you met the next door neighbor there, Mr. Flynn? The one right next to me? It's him um, and his wife. He, yeah, months. he's directly behind this particular property. Have you? Have you? No, I believe they're in Georgia. Okay. There's a renter there. Okay. Is okay. this the one about the lights? About the lights and it about is. the barrier, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time to discuss some of the neighbors' concerns. Next You're year. more okay. than what we'll I mean. We already addressed them, but okay. we've had lights have been the issue, and just I think we went already went over this. But that property was bare since 2008. It's the first we're getting the first uh, certificate of occupancy. So the property owners have let the you know no lights were working. None of the standard parking lights, parking lot lights, and none of the lights on the building. So we simply went in and fixed them. And that made everybody, you know, they're like, whoa, you mean there's a commercial building right there? And that's what happened. But the Mr. Flynn, they're in Georgia, and I did speak with the actual renter, and he's the one who told me they were in Georgia. He's like, yeah, I don't know, but they're in Georgia, so I don't know how they can be getting affected by this. But regardless, we had code enforcement come by, which Farhad is familiar with, 
and we put glare shields on everything, and we're at 3,000K at 100 watts, which meets the city ordinance. And I believe that's it, but if there's something else, we'd be more than happy to address it. Thank you. So we'll pick that discussion up a little bit here with agenda item six. Um, the commissioner's final final thoughts or a, a uh, potential motion re with in relation to agenda item five. Um, I'll say I, I, I have a preference to include the language um, and I'm not familiar with the NRA range source book, but I think more standard is, is better than, than less. So I'm in favor of that. Um, and I'm also in favor, uh, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Watts that, that we can't control what we can't control, but I think that um, putting the, the feet per second uh, limits and, and, the, um, and the design spec, which should also, uh, I guess, put, put limits on caliber size, um, I think those are probably both good add values um, to to the ordinance language, not necessarily for this applicant, but for um, you know, we never know what could come down the road. So, uh, commissioners, any other thoughts or a motion, please? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask the other commissioners, ask all the commissioners, does it make sense to require a special use permit even in? C2 and C3 because of the 24 hour operation of those in um, allowed under those zoning classifications. And, um, and then I, I guess I would just make the statement that uh, I think this is a appropriate for CC and, and C1 because it's, it's not that active. They take up a lot of space, but there aren't that many people using it at any one time. And you know, as a result, it's, it's a low, um, it, it, it's a low impact activity assuming the sound is controlled. So uh, those are my only. I other comments. I would say it's probably not preferable that something like this would be 24 seven. And I don't know what standard are, are, are these typically, you know, based on uh, during the day, working hours, right? Um, and evenings, so have like, until nine o'clock, so it's pretty popular. And can't shoot during work and that's too active. Have you seen these go 24 seven anywhere? Like. Sorry. No, I, I have not. <laughs> no. Okay. And we wouldn't be, yeah, that would be a lot of work. But So maybe it's something we could put in there. Uh, and if somebody wanted to come in into a C3, C2, C3, it'll just have that stipulation that it's not 24-7, yeah. I think we I, might really muddy things up. Yeah. I, I don't know what the concern with having a 20, because it's fully contained inside. How is that a concern if it were 24-hour? And C2 and C3. Traffic. Traffic? Around the building, depending what upon. What about, so movie theaters, arts and music, furniture stores, hotels, motels, restaurants, those are all allowed in C2, C3 without a special use permit with traffic and coming and going and dumpsters and. I know, if you don't mind, I'll add, add to that. You've got. Um, Liquor stores, hotels, motels, uh, spas and gyms, pool halls, billiard halls, those can all be 24 hours in a C2 and C3. So I'm not sure what's different about this one yeah, compared to those. I think we're complicating this. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe it's safe to say that they're most likely not gonna be 24 seven though. Uh, I definitely think we don't wanna extend 24 hour to C, C and C1, right? So no, no, that's right. part of the reason that this, that this carve out is happening. I, I'd go the other way with it and say that because of the the you know regional versus local you know we're we're we're, we're building a bridge here to allow something in cc and c1 under special use permit i'd maybe take that a little bit further and say in those two zoning designations that it's membership only or membership only with a law enforcement carve out that we don't open the door to a regional catchment in CC and C1. Um, 
I don't think regional catchments are appropriate. Again, you know, the, the, the lens that I, I keep taking on these types of topics is, you know, if you own the properties adjacent, you know, and you spent X amount of dollars on that parcel and built on it, you know, who are we to say, well, the, the stakeholder next door just got to rewrite the rule book. I, I don't care for that. Um, so I, I, I would propose that we say CC and C1 are membership only with a law enforcement, you know, qualifying carve out. I don't know what the language would necessarily be there, um, but tie it down a little tighter there, but leave the C2 and C3 component alone because of all of our other uses. So those, that's my thoughts. So just for clarification, you want to leave CC and C1 under special use permit only, mm -hmm. but then carte blanche on C2 and C3. I mean, yeah. that's effectively what John said, is they can put anything in there. Yeah. So, and I'm sensitive to the neighbors as well, but I think the, the design of the facility uh, negates or it minimizes any of that potential noise from escaping. So I'm not sure that there wouldn't be more traffic by including it in C1 or C2 and C3. So maybe even excluding it from C2 and C3, but including it for C and C1, CC and C1. You gotta take me through that again. Yeah, I, I'm confused <laughs> as well. Um, <clears throat> so maybe a question for Farhad. If the applicant applied for C2 or C3 today, would there be any restriction other than the interpretation of a recreational facility? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, no, no, there would, so they could would put not, uh, except right. that we could put the, the cap on the feet per second and the, the, the trap design, which would at least cap the size or velocity of the round that, that could be discharged without a special use permit in C2 and C3. Right, that certainly can be but to your codified earlier, in there. Somewhere. Earlier point, not you yet. Were, we don't have that integrated into the building codes at this point. It's by the, their design. So until we get that integrated in, but we could say, but we could say allowed. We could say allowed by right, allowed by right, allowed by right uh, at this under these parameters. Yeah, you would you would imply that uh, any future consideration would be applicable to those uh, mm -hmm. conditions. You could do that. Yeah, I'd much rather do that then leave it to the interpretation of, you know, who's ever the planner 15 years from now. Right. I, I think that's the, you know, we'll oftentimes say, you know, well, Farhad would catch it. Maybe Farhad's not here in a decade, I, you know. And the next person right. will say, well, I, I don't interpret it that way. But I think where we can put that limited, mm -hmm. and, and we heard, you know, really non-discriminatory constraint on it, I think why not? There's no objection from the applicant, so you know they're, they're willing to do pretty much whatever because they're comfortable with the design and their membership, their clientele. I'm good with that. Okay. Let's take a stab at a motion, if we're okay. Any other discussion? No. Okay. Um, so kind of open motion language here. So in relation to agenda item five, case number TAM 2206, uh, motion to forward a recommendation of approval um, to modify the, the various zoning chapters um, within the agenda item text there uh, with the caveat that the definition include uh, the design standard uh, for max trap design AR500 and max velocity uh, on the round discharge at 3,000 uh, across all uh, categories and require a special use permit to go above and beyond uh, those parameters in all categories, in particular C2 and C3, uh, require that uh, designs be conducted under and measured against the NRA range source book. Is that right? Yeah. Some of the verbiage that you used. Um, I mistakenly used the 3,000 feet per second just as a filler. It, that might need to be looked into in comparison to the NRA book. 
and then second, when in conjunction with the AR500 uh, in relation to the trap, there's multiple different designs for traps. And the design for this project does not use AR500, but uses rubber for that. So using that kind of verbiage would be slightly- so Or equivalent. Yeah, something okay. along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll modify the AR500 to say AR500 or equivalent. Um, And I'd like to see if this floats um, at the vote uh, that we would uh, constrain the CC and C1 to be membership only with a carve out for law enforcement qualification. Um, for special events. Sorry, planning is so <laughs> The council has to vote on it, so. Yeah. <laughs> the only other thing you want to make sure you've got is we just did the 3,000 followed by FPS, so there's a clarification there. Okay. Bar, how do you, is that clear on the motion? Uh, Yes, right. yes, I've been uh, okay. jotting that down, Mr. Chairman. It's a good thing we have now have our- uh, We have fancy software. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. uh, just a quick note, did you want to mention that NRA range source book? You, we did. We did, okay. Yeah. So we've got AR500 or equivalent uh, trap design standard cap on the feet per second of the round at 3,000. Uh, we've got the NRA range source book as the, uh, as the design standard, and we should say that the NRA range source book uh, should prevail um, over the uh, the FPS qualifier and proposing that we include membership only uh, law enforcement qualification or uh, special events specific to the CC and C1 uh, zoning districts. Second. Paul, let me do a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Corey? Aye. Commissioner DePa? Aye. Commissioner Dempster? Aye. Commissioner Kovacevic? Aye. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Vice Chairman Schlossberg? Aye. Chairman Gray? Aye. Seven zero. Thank you, Paula. Okay, now the complimentary agenda item uh, number six, public hearing consideration on public action and special use permit to allow the indoor shooting range uh, on the existing commercial building. Uh, located uh, at the intersection of North Swallow, Suaro Boulevard and East Shea Boulevard in the C1 Neighborhood Commercial and Professional Zoning Districts. Farhad, presentation again, please. All right, thanks again, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. So, uh, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, this came before you originally as a rezone request back on September 12th. Uh, was a rezone request from C1 to C2 now, uh, just in light of um, the, uh, the previous approval for the text amendment that has since changed to a special use permit request um, for, a, for an indoor shooting range at uh, 17205 East Shea Boulevard. Uh, so a lot of this is, uh, nothing with respect to the applicant's request has changed since September. So it's really just the, uh, the uh, uh, the fact that it's uh, a special use permit case now. So uh, this is a, uh, it's within an existing building on about a 1.4 acre property uh, in a commercial strip center that is zone C2, I beg your pardon, C1, um, about 1400 feet uh, southeast of the intersection of uh, Shea and, uh, and Saguaro. And so again, a special use permit request in a C1 zoning district. It is a proposed, uh, indoor live fire range. Um, there is a gun shop on the property. I'm not sure if it's uh, opened yet, but uh, it is allowed by right in the C1 zoning district. So the special use permit is just for the uh, 7,500 square foot, or, or I beg your pardon, um, the building is 7,500 square feet. I think a, a little, uh, about half of that or maybe a little bit less is, is proposed for the, uh, 
the indoor live fire range. We'll see a site plan uh, here coming up. Um, so once again, as I uh, discussed in my previous uh, presentation, uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, but the, uh, the, 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 the purpose and intent of the C1 zoning district is to allow small enterprise businesses serving uh, the immediate neighborhood and also providing uh, uh, services uh, at the, uh, uh, for the community uh, as well. Um, and there's particular attention um, often given to the interface between the commercial use and the neighboring uh, neighborhood uh, um, and that's uh, partly uh, the reason why this is a special use permit case uh, before you to uh, determine whether or not the, uh, the use is compatible with the uh, adjacent neighborhood. Uh, this again, you've, you've seen the aerial before, but this just to give you an idea of the uh, surrounding zoning. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the subject property is zone C1. Um, it is, uh, to, to the, uh, to the uh, west rather, it is zoned R143, so single family residential with a minimum lot size of 43,000 square feet. And across the street uh, on Shea, you'll see uh, C2, C1 again to the south. And uh, up there and uh, where the R5 is, you see some uh, multi, uh, multi-family residential there across the Sirius Wash. This is an overall site plan of the commercial center there. This building has been in existence in, uh, since uh, 2008 and um, uh, only recently have, has staff been seeing uh, new tenants wanting to establish businesses there. Um, there's, uh, among some of the businesses uh, include a, uh, I believe it's a neuropathic uh, uh, medical center, uh, State Farm uh, Insurance, uh, as well as um, some other office uh, uses as well. Um, Zooming in a little bit to the uh, actual unit within the strip center, uh, all that you see there hatched is the uh, live fire range component uh, of this gun shop. So it's 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 about half of the uh, of the unit there. Uh, you've seen this before. This is a, a color rendering, obviously, of the exterior. Um, I've shown these pictures in the, at the previous presentation. Uh, this is the frontage along Shea. Uh, you'll see the building uh, tucked away in the back there, um, uh, away from uh, view from Shea. And uh, some more pictures from within the center. You see the wall in the, uh, the distance there, that's about an eight foot wall uh, separating uh, this commercial center from the residential, single family residential uh, unit right behind it. Uh, this is, here is uh, taken from Firebrick Road on the uh, on the west side, where you can see the uh, the separation of uh, of uses by that wall. So uh, section two point two. Now that this is a special use permit case, uh, establishes standards for review, um, and so uh, this would require an SUP since it is a uh, a C one. Um, so some of the things that council or commission in this case can consider is the nature of the use, some special conditions. Um, pertaining to the property, uh, proposed location, and uh, other things that, such as traffic that might impact uh, the use. Staff is recommending approval of the special use permit uh, uh, case uh, here. Um, uh, we find that it's generally consistent with the general plan goals and policies, and it's uh, minimally, uh, as we, uh, we believe, uh, minimally impactful to the uh, uh, adjacent neighborhoods. Um, with that, I'll conclude my presentation and open up questions, as well as the public. Commissioner Watts. With the restrictions, how hard is it to change the application from special use permit for C1 to just C2 or C3, now that we've opened up the doors for them to be able to go C2, C3? They'd have to move parcels. They can't do that? It's a C1 parcel. So right, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Yeah, it, 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 the, well, it, it, yeah, it is a C1 parcel. There's no proposal before you to, 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 to rezone it. Um, you'll be taking action on the special use permit request as, as, as presented. Um, so there's no, so it's pretty much obsolete now. The, the only thing they could do is change the application from 
the special use permit for C1 to special use permit Correct. for C2. Correct. Or to get it rezoned Z2. Right, and then that would mean us coming before you and reading it into the record and um, taking action accordingly. <coughs> Answers my question. Thank you, uh, Farha. Just uh, I suppose point of order or clarification: the the eventual action on agenda item six with the council would be contingent on the result of agenda item five. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, commissioners, final comments before we open the public hearing. Paula, any speaker cards? Yes, Chairman. One speaker, Lou Taylor. Thank you, Paul. I'm just going to put it here, uh, uh, open the aerial here in case uh, anyone wants to refer to it. Good evening. I'd like to thank all of the commissioners for their obvious astute information that they have for their attention to what is being considered in terms of looking at both the neighborhood in the residential and the commercial aspect and for your time and devotion to doing this because we really appreciate that as residents of Fountain Hills. So thank you. Um, just to start very quickly, I want to thank Mr. Gray for having the eyes of the next door neighbor because my husband and I are the next door neighbors. We live in the residential property that abuts the building. So our property line ends right where that wall starts that is the parking lot. And number one, I just wanted to let you know that we had no, notifi no notification of any of this happening until the end of October, when I walked past the back of the building, walking my dog down the street, and saw the public sign on the property that there was a zoning change. That very same day, we happened to receive three letters, <laughs> all the same regarding this special use permit instead. So the communication really wasn't there at the beginning, but did come at the end. Um, I want to start with the positive things. They have Don and, and his people, <coughs> his architect and everything, they have improved the look and the safety of that area and that building 100%. It looks fantastic. It's been cleaned up. There's security lights there. They were responsive when people said, hey, those lights are shining up into our house, the, up the people across the street. And they did put the hoods on, their security lighting on the side of the house on our side. They put hoods on. Our only lighting issue is inside the store. The inside lights are very bright and there is no way, or they, at this point, they're still in the construction phase but there's no way that those lights are blocked from shining right into our living room when we sit down in the evenings. So one of the things I'm concerned about is the hours of operation and how we can, and, and Sean has said that he would work with us in trying to regulate that lighting so that it doesn't come into our living room. But the hours of operation are extremely important to us and that affects noise as well. If there is a noise factor, and we've been assured that there will not be, that there will be 100% no noise. But we have been assured that that would be a concern to us as well. Am I on the time limit? Well, you were, but Farhad was quick, so we'll I'm give you some more speaker, time. Could I say a few more things? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the hours of operation are important. The lighting inside of the store that reflects into our house is important. Sound is important, but the most important thing is safety. And therefore, having this as a membership only club with a carve out for 
police or whoever, military, whoever, is extremely important to us. So I thank you for your consideration of all of those things, and I would like to reinforce that those are essential when you're in an area that connects to residential property. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. No more speaker cards. No, Chairman. Okay. Uh, we'll call Farhad back up. Um, just want to ask a question. The, the lighting, the, the light um, egressing out from the from the construction. I assume that's that that's something that's under mitigation or no. Um, now, so Lou, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name. Taylor. Tyler. Tyler. Um, they're patrons of our business every day. I could set my watch to walking the dog and all the alarms that go off at our building. But um, in our showroom, it just happens to work out that we have these little windows above and they do just go straight across into their, I, I don't know what part of the house, but the part that is annoying. So we're actually having them do the, um, the shading on the, on the windows um, like next week. And I'll ask them if they can shade both sides of just the windows that would let light into their area. But as far as hours, this is only when we were working late, right? Like six o'clock at night? When it starts to get dark. It's yeah. So our normal hours of operation are pretty much nine to five. But that doesn't mean on special occasions it will be open later. So when they do do the windows, I will ask them if there's an answer for those. I think it's about 12 windows that would let light out. So we'll see if we can do something about that. Okay. No, I appreciate that. That's and I've given you our number, right? Yep. So I didn't get the feedback. So we did move the lights, but apparently it didn't fix the problem, correct? Once we moved the lights? Yeah. So we did move them, trying to get them out of their range, but um, that's what we'll have to do next. Okay. So we don't have a problem doing that. Okay. No, I appreciate you addressing that. Okay. Commissioners? Commissioner Kovacevic? Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to ask Farah, if you could bring the site plan up again, uh, the, the, the letter that was sent, if, if you could put... Um, Your overall? Yeah. Well, can you maybe just show us on that site plan what is what the issues are from that letter? The it, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. In reference to the, the it was a the, letter the light that, leakage or, or there I, was a letter that Paula sent around. Okay, so um, I, I think what was being explained in the initial uh, um, request, which was the rezone. Um, uh, Ms. Tyler had not received a, a letter from our office. Um, however, in the, the second round of letters that went out to the SUP, uh, apparently she did receive the letter. I think he's oh, referring to the letter. Oh, I beg your pardon, the, the email that, which I actually yeah. printed out here. Okay. Yeah, the letter okay. that came from Mr. Flynn. I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. Okay, scratch that. Um, okay, so. Yeah, the walkway being referred to is is, is right here. Um, I guess uh, they were um, advocating some limited uh, uh, accessibility. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the letter in front of, in front of me. May Farhad, yeah. may I read this? Yeah, could you please okay. re read it into the record? All right. <laughs> yeah. So this is on behalf of Jeff Flynn. Uh, he wrote in on agenda item number six. Um, I wish to submit the following written comment. Our home is directly behind the property. The rear parking lot, which seems to anticipate a high amount of use, sits a very short distance from the bottom of our driveway. We would prefer not to have an indoor shooting range so close to our property, especially considering there was C1 space available in the Target Plaza. 
but we would support issuing this permit as long as suitable and tasteful barrier wall is built that shields the view of the parking lot, mitigates the increased lighting and noise, and discourages or eliminates use of the connecting staircase. Thank you. I can go back to that photo. Um, excuse me as I flip through these real quick. Okay, so here on the photo on the right, in the foreground is the walkway. Um, it, it's really a, a, a ramp leading down into the uh, the back of the building there. Oh, that's probably a, a, an egress path, right? It is. So right from that's, Firebrick, that's yeah. probably not something that that we have. Um, Fire marshal have more control over that than we would, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, I. I'm not sure I fully grasp the, the concern about boundary wall between the parking lot. Is that just is that just to shield vehicle use from the residents? Um, I mean, we're making assumptions, sort of I suppose, system, right? But yeah. I, I, can I make an assumption? Yeah, hold on. Yes, if, go ahead, Commissioner. I was going to say it could be because that back wall is more of like a retaining wall than a boundary wall. If you see where the other property is, it looks like a wall wall. But in the back of the property along Firebrook, see how it's kind of more of a retaining wall there? They may be referring to some having more height in that wall. It's already down about six to eight feet. There's a, so there's a huge wall already built. But I can make a comment on the side front. I can explain mm -hmm. If you would, if, if you don't mind, please. Let me go back to the site plan. The overall site plan. Okay. That one there. Um, the actual aerial. <clears throat> so this, we actually, um, my architect Ralph, we got the same complaint or whatever, and we did con talk to the renter. Again, this is somebody who's not even in this state. But if you look at Fire Brick Drive and you see the red outline, and then you see that long curved uh, driveway, mm -hmm. that's at least 100 feet above us. So I'm not, I'm just confused on the whole comment because do we need a 110 foot retaining wall so that their house is protected? Because I, I, I don't understand what they're trying to accomplish here. Their driveway starts down there and then you drive all the way up and I believe it's probably 100 feet, maybe more. Um, the renter, he doesn't have a problem at all, but uh, I, I don't know what they're trying to do. Well, that walkway between the property and the parking lot, it goes down, and we're, like I said, six to eight feet recessed down in the ground, and it is used a lot. Um, I mean, it, like I said, our or we know when anybody's on the property because it's on our property. And then the one that goes off the property is at the front of our property. So we know anybody and everybody, including the homeless people that go through there. Um, but I don't know what the resolution to their complaint is because there's yeah. nothing feasible. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if we were in a different scenario, and what was the date of that letter? Does anybody know? Was that recent? When you read, it was today. It was today. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I didn't see that before the meeting. Um, if the scenario were different and we were talking about rezoning mm -hmm. and we were talking about different hours of operation or we were talking about a modification to the parking schema for the master plan there, then I think that there's reason to deliberate that. But given we're not changing those things, I. I don't think we have jurisdiction um, on that front. Farhad, unless you, you see that differently, I, I don't think that that's, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the concern, but I don't think there's anything that has, we're not, we're not fundamentally changing the, the use or the, the um, well, the use of the property or any of its parameters. So that's, that's not really in our purview, unfortunately, so. Commissioner Watts. Um, I did walk the property. I did look at the elevations, and I don't think you quite make 100 feet, but it's probably yeah. between 60 and 75 feet, but there is a significant elevation change. 
And I also would agree that that is a retaining wall mm -hmm. that um, because it's a hillside and the path goes up. And the other thing is that I, I would assume that that walk was installed at the bequest of whoever got the zoning originally, and there, mm -hmm. that was probably a condition that we probably can't usurp. So, mm -hmm. well, it was C one, and that's the neighborhood district. The C one is supposed to be supporting, right? So, right. so it makes, it makes sense. sense. I was just going to comment, the one thing we probably could do is just discourage people from parking on the street that are going to use the facility. You wouldn't want them, park, you know, wouldn't allow them to park up there. On oh, the street. if that was one of their concerns, absolutely. But they are completely separated and we have ample parking on the property ourselves. So if that was in there and I missed it, well then that is a valid It concern. was not in the letter, no, oh, but okay. just... Reasonable inference. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. But no, believe me, there is plenty of parking in our, on our property. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Dempster. Just to clarify, too, I've been in that home, and to clarify, a wall is not going to, because of the elevation, is not going to shield anything, because it does whatever the footage is, it's very highly elevated. And they have great views going in the other direction, too. You know, the, that's the, the last front thing of the I'd want to be doing with that house is looking down. I mean, they've got. <laughs> Yeah, That's they have views view. surrounding the. All right. Um, so I think uh, to, to uh, Ms. Uh, Tyler's points, we've we've addressed or we're in the process of addressing just as a as a um, neighborhood relations the the light lighting component hours of operation. We're staying under the C one considerations. And I think our agenda item five also um, mitigated uh, use types. So I, I think we're um, I think we're in pretty good shape here. Uh, commissioners, any other comments, or could I request a motion from the commission, please? Mr. Dempster, I would like to make a motion. I'd like to move to approve this special use permit to allow an indoor fighting firing range. At 17205 East Shea Boulevard. And could we just make it contingent on agenda item five? Contingent upon agenda item five. Second. Second. Paul, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Corey? Aye. Commissioner DePaul? Aye. Commissioner Dempster? Aye. Commissioner Kovacevic? Aye. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Vice Chairman Schlossberg? Aye. Chairman Gray? Aye. Seven zero. Thank you, Paula. All right, agenda item seven, review and discuss amendments to, or possible amendments to zoning ordinance chapter seven, parking and loading requirements. Mr. Wesley. I know it just seems like yesterday, but uh, in December of last year, we had our first discussion of this. Hopefully you all remember it well. Commissioner DePock, you remember it well correctly? Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, one delay after another. It's been a while since we discussed this previously. But as you recall, we are looking at uh, uh, update to Chapter 7 of the Zoning Ordinance uh, dealing with park with uh, uh, parking. We did discuss this back in December. We've had it on the agenda a couple of times to follow up on some of the things that came up. Uh, at that previous meeting, uh, the Commission had uh, some items that you wanted us to give us some further look to. That's what we'll be getting at this evening. But again, just a, a little bit of a, of a, a reminder. In doing this uh, amendment to Chapter 7, we um, are trying to clean up some things in the current ordinance, some things that uh, are repeated, some things that are misplaced and hard to find, uh, graphics that are not very clear and visible, so forth. We are looking to uh, make some updates and, and changes and possible additions uh, uh, to the code and uh, revise the schedule of required parking. So. Uh, Here's the current and proposed uh, section headings uh, within the chapter. So in particular, what is now point 7.03, uh, to divide that out into a couple of uh, subsections uh, to improve some readability there in organization. Here's an example of a couple of the tables or, or graphics that are currently in the code that are kind of hard to read. Uh, it's not just because I copied and pasted them here, they're this hard to read anyway. So we're cleaning those up and, and adding some better language to them to make them uh, more usable. So again, at your December meeting, we had a list of a number of items that aren't covered in the current code 
and I asked the commission, what do you think about including some of these in here? And basically, you asked me to go ahead and look at all of them. And so I've got a little bit more information about each of those, plus some other ones as I did that that I came up with that we might also want to consider. So the first of those is bicycle parking. I looked in other codes. I found four other codes that uh, include bicycle parking requirements uh, in there. Uh, the number of spaces and things they required vary quite a bit. There wasn't a lot of consistency there, but based on what I saw, here's a, an example of what we could include in uh, a code if you decide we should include bicycle parking. And basically, as we go through each of these this evening, I'd like a kind of a head nod, yes or no. Yes, let's include bicycle parking, and no, don't worry about it. So I'll know whether to then bring back lang language for further consideration. Even if you give me a, a yes now, you could still say no later. Uh, but um, uh, they'll help me finish up a draft uh, full code to bring back. So again, based on, on what I saw, here's uh, an example of what could go in the code. Uh, specifying uh, when the requirement would be. In, in this case, if you've got at least 20 parking spaces, then we're going to start requiring some bicycle parking in addition to your vehicle parking at one per 10 uh, required vehicle spaces, but no more than 20 uh, uh, bicycle spaces. And then also a little bit about that design of where they should be, a minimum of what would constitute as a bicycle parking space. I'm generally seeing some maybe yeses. Go ahead and include it in the draft. Can I yes. ask a silly question, though? Um, or maybe I should wait till after your <laughs> presentation. But um, yes, I'm head nodding. I love the additional bicycle parking, uh, especially because I purchased an electric bike and I want to be able to secure it with all these hills. Um, is this going to be going forward for new businesses? Yes. Okay, yeah, and so there's, yes, can thank, we, thank you. Uh, uh, excuse me. And I just, can we suggest existing businesses install them? But this is just going forward right. though. So right. Chair, Commissioner Dempster, uh, yes, I, I forgot to mention that earlier as I was introducing this, but that's the downside to any of these. The town is largely built and these standards will apply to any uh, substantial redevelopment or new development. So it'd take a long time for uh, to really show up as something different uh, in a lot of the town. But certainly once the standard's there, if somebody's thinking about it, then we have something we can point to and say, oh yeah, well, why don't you do it like this and encourage it. Quick okay. question. Yes. So when you say redevelopment, uh, could that include like if they just want to redo the parking lot or something, could that be an opportunity? Is that redevelopment? I'm thinking about that. If, if, the, yeah. if they're simply repaving it, no. no. Uh, over here, um, uh, across Palisades in La Montana, where the new Honor Health facility is. We'll be discussing for a while a complete redo of that parking lot that will change it from 90 degree spaces, from angle spaces to 90 degree spaces. Okay. And so that, that would be a time where maybe we could. I'll have to think about that a little bit more. Because uh, if we are possibly. built out, that w our opportunities are limited. Right. So that might so be a good idea. I, I mean, I would just say that in that scenario, I think, you know, John's reference, you know, we're a stakeholder in that type of discussion that's happening right now. We'd be supportive of that from a, you know, from a business perspective. So I uh, say why not capture the opportunity or at least mm -hmm. make it a strong suggestion, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you could be able, you, you could include it when there was a remodel going on because you, similar to ADA, you have to upgrade to a certain standard. Right. So including this provision in a remodel mm -hmm. would be appropriate. Right, again, it depends upon the extent, you know, if it's yeah. something beyond just a simple tenant improvement, but uh, right. I think it's starting to involve something outside the building where this would be redoing the, the sidewalks and the parking, it would start to, to make that possible. Uh, and, and it may be more applicable than some of these other ones that we talk about too, but uh, anyway, so we're seeing high, yes on the, on the bicycle Yeah, parking. just one last comment. I think like the vision is if people know that there's likely a bike um, spot where they're going, they'd be more likely to ride their bikes around versus, oh, is it one of the few that has it? So if that is consistent, then it'll be easier. Yeah. Sure, and, and uh, following up a little bit too on Commissioner Dempster, I, I'm generically saying bike parking, but you know, electric bike or scooters, you know, the big help of any of those. Maximum parking is another thing. Um, uh, looked at that, uh, I found two examples where uh, communities that uh, put in maximum parking requirements to keep from overbuilding parking lots. Um, 
And so the examples I saw were between 120 and 125 percent of the required parking. And so again, here's a, a possible provision that could be added uh, that sets that maximum parking instead of just a minimum. Quick question on that. I did. I think I did read that it was 125 of the minimum. Is that how it was right, written? Right, that's within the code is the minimum. So, so 125 say. of the minimum. So when you say required, is that the same as minimum? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it, I'm probably out of bounds here, but is this an opportunity to horse trade parking for green space or permeable surface with development? instead of just saying you don't have to build it, which would say you could basically do whatever you want. Um, otherwise, up to your, your uh, coverage, is it a, could we say, could we modify this provision to say, if we get into that scenario, um, you know, the square footage that would have been applied to those spaces would need to be um, incorporated into your softscape? So, Chairman, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at exactly how we are proposing other parts of the language in the ordinance, but if it's if the provision's not there, I will uh, add it because I think it should be there. Is any space that's not required for drives or parking needs to be a, a landscape area? You can't just stripe it off or something. And that's kind of what we. I don't exactly know how it ended, but that's kind of how we started out long, long ago with the park place expansion, right? It was, I think, trading parking for um, garden, not garden, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, but anyway, walk. that whole kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't you kind of set up a problem, though, a little bit uh, to be devil's advocate this time? I'm gonna put a parking lot that I have 125%, but I've got a dirt patch that I'm gonna put a picnic table in, so now, building has to develop a set of standards to what you're allowed to do as opposed to just picnic table and dirt. It's still softscape. I could put an umbrella on it and make it look pretty. <laughs> so, Chair, uh, uh, Commissioner Watts, uh, we, you know, when we get a landscape plan in, it'll be part of that landscape plan, we'd be looking for at least some DG on there. We are looking at certain amounts of, of plant material so it looks attractive. Sorry. Okay, so at least for now, yes is on the maximum parking. I'm not hearing any no's. Okay. Uh, shared use parking. So when we have a mixed use project, you can have some office, restaurant, uh, residential uses that use parking at different times of the day and the evening and so forth. And so rather than provide 100% of all the parking requirements, and sometimes, you know, sitting there vacant, there are formulas out there that are used uh, for shared use parking. I found examples in six communities who currently have this provided for in the TCCD district, which is the town center district. And so uh, it would be fairly easy, uh, as shown here in a possible provision, just to uh, reference that for any other mixed use type development. That if they want to, they can use that uh, shared parking uh, option. Okay. Tandem parking. So this is parking one car behind another. Um, so found examples of that in four, four other ordinances, uh, primarily in single family or valet type parking. Uh, it's not allowed currently in Fountain Hills for any required parking. Uh, so possible ordinance provision would be for single family and, or any situation up to four units that we could allow the tandem spaces both counting as uh, required space. Uh, but if you're beyond that, uh, it would only be allowed to count uh, if you've got full-time valet service or uh, with special approval through the zoning administrator uh, for parking in addition to the required spaces. I see head no, I see head yes. My only concern was that with that, would, would that um, cause people to drive in areas that they shouldn't be just to get to that second spot? It could, and that's, that's why it is really so limited. Uh, with single-family residential being kind of the primary place, I see it allowed. 
because one person or one family is in the house, and if they park behind each other, they're just kind of mm -hmm. you know, fighting it out between themselves, and it's, you're not impacting somebody else or in the valet services situations. So the valet has to, okay, move a car to get to that car, and you know, it should all be within their pay surface. That's why it is fairly limited. I'm not sure we gain much by, by allowing it. Um, yeah, I just wonder if we shouldn't tie it specifically to, um, to the dwelling. So the single family piece, get that, and the multifamily mixed use scenario, mm -hmm. you could allow it in the calc, but it would have to calc at the unit level. So unit one being, a, let's say it's a four bedroom, 2,500 square foot, whatever, condo unit, that unit could have two spaces counted as tandem spaces, but that would allow you, that would, you could avoid the scenario where a count could a, a, allow for tandem parking across dwelling units if you, if you tied it down that way. It's probably erroneous, but. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. If the, if the parking spaces are assigned to the units so that you know that, it, that, that the one unit is having those two tandem spaces, otherwise you really couldn't do it. Um, yeah, if, if they were assigned, then, then they could, that could be allowed in your calc. If they're unassigned, then you would have to go back to the old, old calc. Yeah. So again, I, it's a possibility. I don't know if this one's uh, really worth it or not, but again, go whichever way the commission wants to. Off-site parking, um, so so allowing parking not on the site. Uh, found three codes that allow for uh, off-site valet parking, uh, usually within 600 to 1,000 feet. Our currently code, uh, currently our code allows for off-site parking uh, within 300 feet, uh, but requires insurance from that property owner of some kind that um, they will uh, guarantee that that parking. So again, yeah, we do have some provision for it currently that could be expanded upon a little bit to expand the distance uh, a little bit. Um, I put in here uh, 1,000 feet versus the 300 we have currently. Um, but then um, it would need uh, an agreement that guarantees uh, that that parking uh, will be uh, made available long term. And then also the one that uh, we don't have at all is a, a specific allowance for valet parking. And so that's maybe the more useful piece of that, I think. Um, so but it, again, is the guarantee a deed restriction, or how do you tie that? So down? on the first one, yeah, you know, it, it basically is a deed restriction. Something that could be recorded the, at the uh, clerk's office saying this property owner has guaranteed for okay. so many years anyway that they will allow this owner to park on their property. And and then chase that rabbit for a second if let's say I own the parking lot that was deed restricted we don't currently require a title report with an application for redevelopment right so would that ever actually be caught if we entered into one of these we would need to put it on our maps also uh, that it's been approved so that we'd catch it that way John, may I ask, um, how is long-term, it says the agreements must guarantee long-term availability. I mean, how do you define long-term? Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, a year, I'm guessing it should be multiple years, well, right? Because yeah, of business. Be years. Yeah. Yes. And, Thinking out loud, the deed would go with the property if it was sold, right? The deed restriction would follow the property. Yes. Um, but that would have to be specified, correct? Yes. The long, the, it would have to be defined and agreed to. Thank you. What do you think about, I don't know if that scenario ever plays out, but going to as far as like a hold as one type arrangement and where the two properties are are legally bound beyond a deed restriction so that one couldn't be conveyed without the other i mean if you want if you want a development so bad 
that you have to look at off-site parking a thousand feet away, shouldn't we take that far enough to require those properties to be held as one? I think it's too restrictive. I, I, I think as long as you have it in the disclosure documents and it's a requirement, it's, it's just too restrictive on people, on the owners. So, uh, <clears throat> commissioners, uh, the current language in the code is very simple. It says, whenever the use of a separate lot or parcel is proposed for fulfillment of minimum parking requirements, the owner shall submit as part of his application satisfactory assurance that the separate lot or parcel is permanently committed to parking use by enforcement legal measure. I, just, I, I have a little bit of experience with something similar to this. And we had a shopping center in Chandler where it, it we had a lot of restaurant uses and the evenings the parking lot just filled up. And we rented parking from a church across the street and up the road, certainly within a thousand feet. Nobody wanted to use it. It, it Everybody would just rather complain about the parking and drive around the parking lot until a spot opened up. Nobody wanted to go up to the, um, nobody wanted to go up and use the church. The restaurants themselves had refused to have their employees park up there and walk. The employees themselves, um, you know, just didn't, didn't feel safe, said they didn't feel safe. Um, I, I don't, I, I, and, and my conclusion is if, we, if we, we, we can have it in there, we can say it, but they're not going to use it. So why grant the land use on that parking when we, you know, when, I mean, in my experience, they're not going to use that parking. So why give them the benefit of denser, you know, more intense use of the land based on that parking. I, I, I don't, I would say I, I would not be interested in that. Do, do we, is there a provision in the code to allow um, municipal spaces to account for a, a percentage of your? No, not specifically, uh, Chairman. The closest thing we have is the whole plat 208, which isn't really municipal, but it was set up in the early platting of that property. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Kovacic yeah. that generally, from my experience as a contractor, you, you buy or lease spaces in order to find the number of spaces that, you're, that are necessary. And nobody ever honors them because we don't have an enforcement mechanism to do that. So there's no way. People driving around a lot, nobody sees them. They just keep driving around and they find a place eventually. They find a neighbor's place. They find somebody else. But they met the letter of the law with a regulation and ignored it. So I don't know that we need to try and in, invent a new problem. <laughs> Got enough already, right? And John, was there a trigger for this or is this is just part of, you know, enhancing this ordinance? Yeah, so it was just, uh, again, as I was uh, working on the, the update to the code, something I'm familiar with, uh, you know, other uh, communities have used, so just put it out here to see if there's interest and bring it to Silent Hills. Again, we do have a limited provision already for the 300 feet. Um, there's nothing here about valet parking, however. Uh, so these are kind of tied together uh, in the way I present it here, but uh, you know, we could just stick with the current provision. 300 feet, that's not too mm -hmm. far away. Maybe a little bit more usable, um, but then maybe add the valet parking. Um, yeah, I was gonna say the only benefit I could think is valet parking, right? Because if that church was off site and you had valet, the drivers might be more likely to go bring the cars over there, but. Yeah. Thousand feet's quite a ways, but yeah, could be. Yeah. Okay, so. so. Okay, seeing some no's on that one. Okay, so as I worked on that, I came up with a few other items that we might want to consider. Electric vehicle charging. We don't have any requirements in the code currently. 
that uh, some uh, amount of spaces be set aside for, uh, or at least made available to be retrofitted into electric vehicle charging. And so I looked at that, found three communities uh, that provide some level of it. And so based on those as examples, uh, some possible wording, if you have a parking lot of 20 more spaces, um, or serve multi-residents or located 100 feet of a major arterial street that include installation of conduits, conduits for at least five parking spaces, 5% 5 of parking spaces. So these are conduits there. So at some point in the future, if you um, want to add the electric vehicles, that becomes more popular and more needed, that it's available. So that's the idea here. Yes, no, maybe. I love that idea. I think the 5% is uh, pretty limited. I think that you know this electric, um, electric cars is gonna be exponential. We're gonna see it explode. What is it, California said by 2030, they're gonna be selling only electric cars. So the 5%, um, would the, I don't know anything about the cables, but would they just be able to expand to be able to go into more parking spaces without tearing up the, the pavement? If so, you did it this way, wrote it this way. So yeah, so I don't know. Uh, Commissioner Watts, with his uh, construction knowledge, could probably answer that better. But, but I would think, it, unless you've laid the conduit down before you put the asphalt, you know, beyond where you put that conduit initially, yes, you'd have to tear up the, the pavement to, uh, to add the facility. So it's just trying to get them to think about it up front as they're building a parking lot and provide some capability. But otherwise, okay. at that point, you're just you know, making that connection, not really tearing up the... You gotta be real specific spot. about what you put in, conduit size, wire size, all of the preliminaries, or you're gonna take it up and really anyway, cause pull it, it all out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, and conduits get crushed, conduits get plugged, conduits have to be reboard. But I'd be more interested. What are you, your thoughts on size of, of service entrance? Big impact. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm all for it. Um, mm -hmm. I just think if we're saying, I don't know what the draw on five percent of spaces is on a on a uh, on a lot, but that's asking for, that's asking a lot on the service end. It's asking for a healthy premium on the service entrance section for a lot of lots. I guess maybe I should change my angle. My question is, is, is that burden justified? I think when you're talking about a commercial installation, the service entrance section upsizing would probably be nominal. I, I, if you put a 1,000 amp section, 4,000 amp section, whatever you put in, um, there's always spare capacity. They're never built on a marginal level, level because of future expansion in the facility. So it's rare. In residential or, or in uh, condos, apartments, you still have the same parking space requirements so you can project the number of vehicles that you would have and approximate based upon today's calculation what a charging station requires and do some of that projection. But I think you gotta be very specific about it. And hopefully in the future, the charging requirements become less of a load on service center and sections, whether they're residential or commercial. Yeah, he, he answered my question there, but I mean, there are a couple of charging stations in town now that are not working. Um, so, uh, you know, when you were speaking of a burden on um, um, who who would be the one that, would there be something that, uh, written in here that talks about who maintains it also? Or would that be for the owner of the of the property? Yeah, Chairman, uh, Commissioner, to that, that would certainly be the thought at the moment is that um, what we're trying to encourage is that anybody uh, putting in a new large parking lot, they would be thinking about this up front and at least putting in this conduit. If they're really you know, looking at their market, they may be putting in the charging spaces already because they see enough of their uh, residents or, or users are going to want it anyway. But at least get that conduit in place so that as a, that market continues to grow, it'd be easier for them then to put in those, uh, those uh, charging stations. But the expectation then those would be responsibility of the owner of that property to install and maintain. 
you know, I don't know, there may be businesses out there that start doing that and providing them and they maintain them or, or whatever, but uh, it wouldn't be the town. Yeah. All right. I, I think I'm more concerned about Corey's, Commissioner Corey's uh, concern with the proliferation of electric vehicles. If you size today based on park, even parking spaces, you're most likely going to be undersized in the future. So how do you project upsizing unless you do it based on parking spaces or uh, personnel that live or work in a particular area? I, I think there's a struggle. I think there's a lot of work. I absolutely think that we ought to do it, but I don't think this quite covers it. Okay. So yes on the idea, but a little bit more work maybe on the approach. That's my feel. Okay. Okay. Let's, I'll look close to that and see what I come up with. Passenger pickup. So uh, we have an aging population, There's more ride choice uh, options happening out there. We currently require loading spaces for goods uh, deliveries, but we don't really have anything that requires loading spaces for people. Uh, so maybe, again, uh, that's something we should look at. And so uh, put out here some, uh, let's see here. I guess I'm not sure I found this. It seems like I found this in a couple of codes. Oh, I didn't say that right there. Um, so here's, uh, again, some idea for how it might work in terms of near primary entrances, that there would be a number of uh, passenger pickup spaces uh, required at certain sizes. And then here's an idea of, of you know, different types of uses and the number of passenger pickup spaces that might go with those types of uses. This is a curious topic for me because I think the facilities and places like, you know, you have recreation two spaces. Well, golf is a recreation and they have plenty of, you know, they build that into their um, location and facility and healthcare facilities. I feel like they have that provision. I mean, I think about what, what do people do now? Um, and you, I think, is the intent to, I think you'd go crazy with a table like this because it, it can't possibly cover everything. There's always going to be something. But the ones that you do have, nursing and convalescence, a convalescent, I think, again, they have provisions that I look at. Morningstar, I mean, they have that big drive around. And all the golf places, recreation, have areas built in, so, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, restaurants then, I mean, sometimes it's just not gonna be feasible um, to do that based on location. And is that gonna cause, you know, difficulties for the business because the, the way they're set up, they're on the avenue or something and they just can't have a drop off spot. I don't know, just my thought. I hear you, and it could take away from one of their valuable parking spaces if they if it's dedicated to this. But I do like the idea, and it's very it's safe, right? So if somebody wants to be dropped off and not being dropped off in the middle of the street, where and then having to walk through the parking lot to the building, so some kind of dedicated space. But I think to your point, it could be easier just to say a passenger pickup spot rather than figuring out who gets how many. I think one is probably most appropriate. Because what? How long are they going to take to drop off and pick up? Right, it, one might be good enough. Okay, I, I think most of the people that either are resident or visit Fountain Hills subscribe to the New York philosophy of double parking anywhere they can. They just pull up at the most convenient spot, open the door, out goes, and it, whether it's Uber, or whomever. Um, it's going to be very. You don't have an enforcement arm. That's the that's the problem with this. There's just no enforcement. That's why I went around you yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I agree with Commissioner Dempster. I think leave it in, but a simple, simple directional parking. statement is probably okay. sufficient. Okay. Covered parking. It's hot out there. Nice to cover the parking spaces. Yes. Um, so, um, again, I know I found one or two examples of this, but I didn't put, put it in here. Um, so uh, possible examples, uh, 
for single family, your two garage spaces, whether you use them or not, are your you know, two required there typically, uh, but require that again in, in multi-residence. And office is the other one that's most often used, a little harder to do in commercial. Their cars are coming and going so much. Office, they're more likely to stay a little bit longer and benefit from it. Um, and so that's, that's what I've seen in some other codes. Okay. John, real quick. Yes. So Platt 208, that parking lot. So when office opens up, I mean, you can't, right? It, it has Someone to be else. on the lot itself. Okay. When you're using that, that common situation, yeah. And again, it would apply to any new development, substantial redevelopment. Right. You're not going to go back and start finding offices and say you've got to add covered Shoot, parking. I was so, hoping to get covered parking. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, well, make, we'll, we'll put a specific in here, and plus one for, for shoot. Yeah, yeah okay. that works. Okay. And just one more comment, too. Like, um, cars could be solar in the future. So that? if we have the covered parking, are they going to get charged? Mm. Brings me to another point. Could there be conduit in the in the uh, <laughs> covered parking, right? Mm. Using the solar panels on the top to plug cars in. Mm. Just some ideas. Okay. Getting real futuristic mm. there. Getting, okay. Ahead of so <laughs> the last piece I have out here, just mostly just to kind of show you this evening, this evening it's, it's a lot of information. Um, so on the left is uh, what's being looked at in terms of the revised parking table. On the right is the current. They don't line up at all, so don't try to make them line up uh, because the new one's organized a little bit differently. Although with each of these, you'll see a few things uh, on the same page. Um, the residential is pretty much the same uh, as proposed, as current, but do include in there under the multi-residence that uh, the number is cut in half if it's a senior, dedicated senior uh, uh, designated type housing. That uh, one is, of the things, sorry, go ahead. that the senior piece is new. Yes, that piece um, is new. Is that, have you talked to Morningstar or Fountain View about maybe how many residents do in fact drive and how many parking spots they need? I know this is right. for future, but right. you know, no, as that, a. Right. We, we could do that. Um, I think those would actually come up under another category, but I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. That's a good question and a good, good way to look at it. You'll see when you look down the current list on the right-hand side, you get down, for example, mobile home parks and subdivisions, uh, plus one space for two employees. There's a lot of things like that in the current code. We never know how many employees they have in the basic parking standard on number of employees. I've tried to uh, get rid of ones uh, like that uh, in, the, uh, in, the in the revisions. Um, and so again, uh, you can kind of compare, try to, and on the one hand, I started with a very expanded list of new uses, going back to a comment made earlier to Commissioner Watts, I've gone through and looked at all of our uses in the ordinance for the different uh, zoning districts and at our current table of uses here for parking, they don't match very well, and uh, I think we can benefit just in our, our different uh, uh, zoning districts, uh, commercial zoning districts in particular, but overall by arranging things by categories instead of trying to list specific uses and then some examples. So it's easier in the future then to classify things and place things in categories. So I have that ex kind of expanded list. I started that with the parking and after that was done, kind of went back and combined ones that were really similar. And so you can see some of that here. Um, so assembly uses. Uh, includes uh, a variety of things that are listed out separately under the current code, but all have the same parking requirement. Um, and come up with these requirement, the, the, these proposed requirements. Started with our code, things generally work well here as far as I know, but looked at some national standards and a number of other codes uh, from across the, uh, the valley and, and some other places just to kind of see what people use. And it's all over the place. There, there's no one, one number that fits. Uh, it's a lot more art than science on this, but tried to come to reasonable numbers uh, and use the current number as much as possible just because that's the way we're built. Um, and just going through a few more of these. Um, and here's another one on the car washes, uh, which relates it to number of employees, which again, I find difficult. Uh, barbershop related to service chairs. That's maybe a little bit better, but still those things can change easily. So I really try to relate it back to the square foot of, of the space 
much as possible because that changes much less uh, over time. Can you define stacking under car, car wash? It says two stacking spaces so or five stacking. That's the number of cars that can fit without blocking a, a drive aisle. Okay, thank you. So usually you think about you know, a parking space is 19 feet. We talk about stacking, we usually go to 20 just to give a little space between uh, the cars. Yeah, there you go. And again, just uh, a few more here. Going through and seeing some of the comparisons. Um, How about what's outdoor storage? Do we have outdoor storage? Um, so I'm trying to think if we have any outdoor storage as a primary use here. There's some associated with other types of indoor storage. Um, Would that be like RV stuff? Yeah, are you uh, talking? Uh, okay, so like a but, colony and. Right, some of those things in there. Like boats uh, and that kind of thing? Right. But I could see things like that being shared also, right? Because not everybody's there at the same time. I guess my question beyond this would be, when we get to this point where you're putting these in, would you be able to tell us if this new parking space requirement is, in, is gonna be more than we have now or less than we right. have? So, so when, we, when we come back to the actual ordinance, I'll go through the, the effort of actually lining these things up. Uh, okay. So that you can see that better, um, you know, what the real changes are. It might be a little more clear when we can right. see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right now, I just uh, I had the one column, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just let you see what the current ones are, um, to have some feel for it. But didn't okay. take it. That was much too much rearranging to do right now, even though I've had eleven months to do it. I do like the idea of your categorizing. It makes life a lot easier. And the only thing I saw here that I was. All the work we put into sober living homes and those types of communities, and now we've got a different term. So I'm assuming you're going to fix, right. change that term right. at some point. Right. So I'll have to come back in here. So I would fit in here in terms of sober living where we have the group housing. Uh, it would fit, and there's another type there. Yeah, the boarding house and dormitory and yeah. such. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Otherwise, I like it. So. Okay. I have a okay. question. I have one question for you. We, we've entertained a couple of projects in the last year, year and a half, um, with like CC zoning bringing in residential. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if this is the place for it, but would it make any sense to require dedicated parking for the residences? Um, I don't know that we did that at uh, um, Amherst and Saguaro on that project. I think the other project up uh, north did have separate parking for the residences, indoor parking for the residences, which was which was good. But I, I, I just see the residents that either rent or own at Amherst and Saguaro having to fight restaurant uses for parking if they come home at you know dinner hour and and I don't think we want to be in that situation I don't think they want to be in that situation uh, is this the place to address something like that I'll think about that that's that is a good point to bring up uh, to see how it might fit in here um, doesn't your cover dedicated provision wouldn't that mm -hmm bridge and account for that yes probably. for that that was our gap on both of those well the the one up north was within the one on King Street was was questionable because that was all communal mm -hmm. and then even on Park Place I think it was phase two of Park Place had no, it wasn't communal but they were all outdoor uncovered spaces for the most part so building B with Park Place over here on Verde River does have covered parking, at least one per unit. Okay. Um, but um, just as an update for the uh, Kings Tree and Saguaro, 
in order to address the parking concerns that we've had all along, they are providing uh, parking spaces for four, six of the units. The ones that back into the parking lot will have indoor uh, parking with those. That's good to know. May I ask one more question about the residential breakdown? I think some clarification, you have single comma attached or detached and duplex and then multi-resident, multiple residents. Um, duplex is multi-resident and it, you have two per unit. Um, and I thought in the past, was it by bedroom, two per bedroom, or has it always been two uh, by unit? So for the single family and the duplex, it has been two per unit. Okay. And then is the attached or detached, is that referencing single family homes? Yes. Okay. And then an accessory dwelling unit, is that a casita? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, thank you for that input this evening. Based on that, I will prepare an ordinance to bring back to you probably in January. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. All right, number eight, commission discussion, request for research to staff commissioners. <laughs> Commissioner Corey. Um, somebody brought this up in one of our other meetings, um, and it was around um, how the agendas are given to us. And sometimes I find it hard to follow along with, when there's a lot of content. And I think they suggested to kind of redline anything that was the old data and highlight it in green or another color, what's going to be the new, the new verbiage. And that might just help us follow along with it a little bit better. So I don't know if that's an option that we could maybe adopt yep. the agendas? Okay, cool. Commissioner Watts. I don't know if this is the form for it or not, but if we're talking about parking spaces and we're talking about bicycles, bicycles do not, the regulations for bicycles, I don't know how we enforce them, but they own the road. And I'm an advocate of riding a bicycle, but when they ride outside the bicycle lane, when they cross the street at the roundabouts, when they, I mean, they just ignore them. Is there anything we can do to educate a bicyclist that they're jeopardizing their lives? And then they get mad at the, the motorist when, I don't, me in particular, so when you went around me and you honked your horn at me, that there was a bicyclist there. And I got a, a sign, a wave. <laughs> what do we do about bicycles? Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner, that is a challenge, and we are aware of that challenge. We do, as we worked on the active transportation plan, that's one of the things in there, uh, is uh, some bicycle safety awareness uh, materials, and information on that is available there, but who goes and looks there? Um, I think there are some uh, you know, uh, pamphlets available on that, but getting people to read it and follow it uh, is, is a challenge, but... Um, there was a uh, cyclist just the other day, that, and there was a sheriff's department Sheriff's cruiser sitting there, cyclists blew right through a light, even though there was no traffic coming. There was still a red light that they should have uh, should have honored, and the sheriff's department just let it go. And so I don't know if there's any enforcement, law enforcement wise, to help with that situation or not. And maybe that's what we need to do is start enforcing what the rules of the road are as they apply to cyclists as well as motor vehicles. That's exactly what I was going to say. The uh, MCSO needs to enforce the rules. And, and, I, and I imagine it would be up to the town to ask them to do that. Yeah, I will try to remember with Paula's help to bring that up with them, as well as uh, uh, our public information person is looking at the next uh, uh, insider and things that might go in there. And so maybe that's a place, again, we can remind people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, summary of requests. John, good to go. Yeah. Uh, any report? Uh, nothing too much. Uh, as you know, we will have a uh, December meeting. Uh, we have two items uh, that will be on that agenda. One will be a special use permit for a golf net. 
and the other will be to continue our discussion of the possible ordinance dealing with detox and drug treatment facilities. Did you say golf net? Golf net. Oh. Golf nets. That's the one you're going to show up for? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rather interesting case I haven't seen before. So. We do either. Yeah, we did. No, we get them all the time, but we make a recommendation and someone else decides on golf nets. So it makes perfect sense to me. Okay. All right. Adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you.